Uh, my name is Arlene Pablo. I'm done. the current chair of the Monterey County Chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. I would like to start by reading a land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional land of the indigenous people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who, would, who have stewarded it through the generations. We are on the indigenous homeland of the Esalen people, also known as Arbolino, Monterey Band, and Rumson. Please take note of the natural beauty and remember that ancestors rest below pathways and on other less traveled areas. We are here. Let God lie. So we are gathered here today to honor our 45th recipient of the Ralph B. Atkinson Award for Civil Liberties. And all of our past recipients are wonderful leaders of our community, and we are so glad to welcome Regina Mason into that rather elite club. According to my assessment, and I don't know everybody's name, there are five past recipients here today. We have Ruthie Watts. Helen Rucker, <laughs> Mel Mason, <laughs> and Ann Todd Jealous, <laughs> and Fred Jealous. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us here today. So, Ralph D. Atkinson was a chemical engineer. And he brought us beauty in the form of color film. So he first worked for Eastman Kodak Company on the East Coast, and he developed Kodachrome, the, the song we sing about Kodachrome, right? It's wonderful. And then he moved to Los Angeles, and he worked there for 40 years on making motion pictures colorful. He brought he had the first Academy Award in 1940 for a film in color. And then he did that for almost 20 years and one day he said, what am I doing with my life? And he just got rid of his business and he moved up to the Big Sur coastline and then he dedicated the rest of his life to civil liberties. He was not only uh, very active in the ACLU, he was on the Monterey uh, Foundation, or Peninsula Foundation, he was a MPC trustee and chair, um, and unfortunately he suffered from seizures and his doctor told him not to drive, but there was an emergency meeting of the ACLU and he took off to that meeting to make sure he was there and he was killed in a car accident in 1975. So anyway, um, in, in addition to Ralph, I would like to remember the two past recipients who passed away this past year, um, and they are Michael Stamp and E. Walker James. Oh, I am supposed to introduce elected officials, and it's a bit awkward because one is one of my best friends. It's the Mayor Tyler Williamson. <laughs> He's the Mayor of Monterey, and the Vice Mayor of Monterey is Alan Hoffa, who is my better half. <laughs> Okay, so Tyler 
um, is a co-founder of the uh, Peninsula Pride, in addition to being the current mayor of Monterey. He has done many other wonderful things for our community, and I won't take any more of his time. So I'm hoping to make this maybe a little bit of an interactive process, because I know a lot of you, and I don't think that there's much more that I can say that you all don't already know. You know, for the most part, where um, I stand as far as values and, and uh, my position on things in the community. Um, but it, if you do know me, um, one of the things that's most important to me is civic engagement, transparency, and how do we remove those barriers that prevent people from participating in the political process in the first place. Um, and oftentimes, there's this conversation around, you know, I look at it from a systemic perspective. Um, other people might want to look at it from an individual responsibility perspective. I think that they're both valid. Um, I think the concern that I have with being narrowly focused on the individual perspective is that you lose a sense of what are those systemic issues that prevent folks in society, particularly certain groups of folks in society, from engaging in the first place. And naturally, my mind goes to things like you know, people working multiple jobs, um, thinking about our community and the hospitality industry. There, there are folks in that industry that are working multiple jobs. Um, maybe they have families that they're taking care of. Maybe they've come to a council meeting in the past or a public meeting in the past and they didn't hear the elected leaders speak about issues that are important to them. So why show up to a public setting when your elected officials aren't listening to the things that are directly affecting your life? And so um, I think that we've done a great job of that in the city of Monterey in trying to start moving things in the right direction, really creating a space for folks, um, particularly underrepresented folks in the community, to show up and be present more. There's a lot of work to do, and it's not going to change overnight. In fact, we didn't get here overnight, so we can't expect to just change it in the, the drop of a dime. Um, but there's a lot of work still ahead for us to, to achieve. All that being said, that's my little preamble, um, to get to this most recent incident that occurred at our council meeting on September 19th. And so for those that haven't heard, um, on September 19th, we had two uh, agenda items. Um, in the afternoon, we discussed uh, moving forward with the rental registry. Um, and, and essentially, for those that maybe not aren't fully familiar with what a rental registry is, it's a, it's a requirement by the jurisdiction for any landlords to register their property with the city. And through that process, we collect data so that we can have a better assessment of the rental stock that exists within the city. And what a lot of jurisdictions do post implementation of a registry or simultaneously while implementing the registry is implement some level of rent control or I think what would better be termed rent stabilization. Um, and just cause eviction policies. Um, and so what that looks like for the city of Monterey is yet to be determined, but that was what we were discussing in our afternoon session. And then the evening session came, so we took a break, and we came back to our evening session, and we were discussing approving our draft housing element that was going to the state. And for those that don't know what a housing element is, it's a requirement by the state that every jurisdiction submit every eight years it identifies the number of housing units that that jurisdiction is supposed to plan to develop over that next eight years, um, the barriers to developing it, and what are you going to do to remove the barriers. And I'm making, I'm very much simplifying this, but um, that's what we were approving in the evening session. And there were folks that had came that had participated in the afternoon session at our prior meeting that came and called the council fascists, um, that called us Nazi Germany. Um, and so when we got to the evening session, when the incident that I'm really speaking to you about today came, um, the first speaker came online and I couldn't quite put ping if it was an extension of what was happening from the prior topic or whether it was something else. Um, but they started spewing hate. And um, I, I, I won't repeat the things that were said. Um, but what I will tell you is that it was racist and anti-Semitic comments. Um, the worst that I've ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, and so while I'm on the dais chairing the council meeting, um, by the way, this person called in. They were participating via Zoom. 
Um, I have council member um, uh, Barber, Kim Barber, on my left, and next to her I have um, council member Ed Smith. And they're both basically in my ear telling me to cut these people off. Um, and I completely understand their sentiment because we're exposing the public to hearing this hateful speech. And again, getting back to the, the, the intro a little bit in regards to creating a space for public participation, this is a way to turn people away from wanting to participate. Who wants to be exposed to hate speech? Um, so I completely understood where they were coming from, though the other side of this conversation is people's First Amendment rights. And so in this moment, we're truly balancing hate speech versus freedom of speech. Um, and so beyond Ed Smith, our city attorney was sitting next to him, and I'm looking at her trying to find some space of understanding where's our wiggle room here, how do we, how do we address this, um, and there was probably three or four speakers that said these types of comments. So if you can imagine, they each have three minutes. Um, this was going on for about 10 minutes or so um, before I felt that I was finally in a space to be able to take care of it. And I got some um, positive affirmation from our city attorney to uh, basically, if they're not on topic, to, to give them a warning and cut them off. And, and that's what I did. Now, there's another little part of the conflict that was created here, which is these folks, it was a small group of folks, but they would call in and they would hang up, call back in using a different name, and so then they would jump in line to speak during public comment, so public comment wouldn't end. And it was just turning into this, ne this never-ending hate speech, vile, toxic, um, and you hear people in the audience groaning, and the council is clearly disturbed and upset. Um, and so finally, fortunately, um, I started, you know, the moment that I heard somebody going off on this kind of hate speech and not being on topic, I would give them the warning. If you're not talking on topic, if you don't get back on topic, I'll cut you off. And the moment that it did, I cut them off. And so we were able to do it fast enough to where I guess they weren't able to sign back in and jump back in line. But then there was another topic that came up um, where we had to go back out into public comment. And in fact, I was, um, it, my property was close by to the, the, the projects that were being approved, so I had to recuse myself. And Alan, as the vice mayor, had to step up as chair of the council. So I stepped out and have no clue what's going on in the chambers, but it essentially started happening again. And fortunately, um, Alan just called a break. Um, and we came back in, we chatted about it, and we decided to go ahead and cancel the meeting. So that night, we weren't able to approve our draft housing element. In fact, we just directed staff to go ahead and submit the draft, the draft housing element that we had. Um, and to be honest, it was a pretty good housing element as it was, um, though it's unfortunate that this hate speech distracts us from being able to do the people's work. Um, and again, my biggest concern, oh, did I have higher? My biggest concern is the concern of people not wanting to come back and continue participating in the political process. I mean, just imagine if that was somebody's first time to a council meeting. Who wants to continue going to that? Um, so from there, we essentially had to decide how are we going to move forward. And Alan, um, as the vice mayor, and I had a, a couple of meetings with staff to try to figure it out. And now we're in this space of having this suite of procedures for public participation, which already kind of became lengthy with adding Zoom in. And so I'll, I'll pause here for a second and just say, Think about this for a second. When, before the pandemic happened, everybody had to come into the chambers to speak. And it wasn't until the pandemic when we went 100% remote where people started participating virtually. And all jurisdictions were faced with the option to what to do once we started meeting in person again. And I think that the city of Monterey took the right direction of continuing to allow public participation via Zoom um, so that way, folks, to me, it is a social justice, a social, social equity issue um, for people to participate. I mean, think about folks that might be sick um, or that are still concerned or immunocompromised and concerned about um, 
contracting COVID, whatever the issue might be, having family and you know, trying to get dinner ready, you know, whatever it is, it really creates a space to allow folks to continue to participate in a way that they probably wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, but we also were hearing that other jurisdictions that had dealt with this similarly had decided because of what the hate speech that happened to completely eliminate public comments via Zoom. Um, I think that we found the right middle ground. I think time, time will tell. Um, but I was really concerned about our ability to be able to, to lose that option for folks. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, a little bit of the background in regards to um, what happened in the city of Monterey. <clears throat> Even though Alan and I made the, the decision initially about how to move forward, we actually just met with the council on <clears throat> Wednesday to, to get the input of the entire council so that we're all on the same page together as far as what public participation looks like. We made some small modifications, but generally speaking, City of Monterey is still open for business, so um, hopefully everybody here that is willing to come and share uh, your public feedback in, in the council chambers, you're willing to do so. And maybe I can inspire you to come and speak during council meetings. And that's kind of one of the points that I want to share with you all today, because at this point, the conversation is, so what now? How do we... Um, we, we can't prevent hate speech, and I, did, I didn't get into this part in a second, but we can't stop hate speech. We have to allow people to speak. Um, but our, one of my concerns is, again, that we lose people because we're continuing to allow folks to call in on Zoom. <clears throat> so part of my hope is with you all that I encourage you to show up, and as you're having conversations with folks in the community, encourage them to show up. It's really important for us to get public engagement. And I think that we have a council now that's really willing to hear people out in the community and take in that feedback. And again, as I was expressing, we're addressing issues that I think are important to the community. Um, and so hopefully these things are helping to reduce the barriers. Um, but you all are leaders of the community. And by seeing people like you show up to public settings, it really, I think, inspires other people um, to do the same, whether that's people in your network or maybe somebody that just happens to be listening into that meeting, um, it's just really important that we engage in the political process because just because we're a democracy on paper, it doesn't mean that we're actually practicing democracy because democracy requires us to all engage, right? By the people, for the people. Um, and so I, I didn't get to this nuance here um, about the balance between the First Amendment and, and hate speech. Essentially, if somebody is coming and sharing hateful, vile speech, we have to allow that. There's nothing that we can do to turn that off. Now, I did share earlier that if they're not on topic, um, we can pull them, pull them back on topic or I can remove them from being able to speak. Um, but one of the things that happened during this meeting was that they were finding ways of trying to connect their hate speech to the topic. So I own two rentals in the city of Monterey and they would go and then they would start laying into their hate speech again that I'm not going to repeat here. So there is some nuance here where there's a fine line that we have to play. Um, and these are organized groups. Um, I, I found out later that the, the groups that were organizing and, and doing this hate speech, not just to the city of Monterey, but across this country included three, um, three groups, including the Proud Boys and Make America White Again. Um, so these are the folks that are doing it. They are somewhat organized, and I, I'm sure um, you know, might be willing to try to fight things in court if, if it leads to that. So we have to be able to make sure that we maintain that. But again, we've come up with some policies in the city of Monterey um, that we think we'll be able to make this work moving forward without removing that option of Zoom, and we'll see how it goes. Um, it's unfortunate that we're in this space, and this will be my last point. I, I kind of want to get some feedback from you all too, but <clears throat> it's unfortunate that we're, we're here. And, and one of the concerns that I have is that we're moving forward in a space in society of doing less this and having a conversation with each other, and everything is becoming so remote and removed. Uh, and then the pandemic happened, and I think that that created further isolation. 
Um, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing when we don't create conversations. I mean, look what's happening in the world right now. Um, we need to create a space where we can sit down with each other, have a dialogue, um, and again, even if you don't agree with me, and, and I'm sure that there are things that some of you can think about where you don't align with me, um, that's completely okay. In fact, that's how it should be, right? But how do you create that space to allow folks to come in and be part of the conversation, be part of the dialogue? Um, we need to talk to each other. We need to, we need to be able to be open and, and listen to each other because collectively, we're gonna come up with a solution that works for us. And if it doesn't, let's continue having that conversation so we can figure it out together. Um, so with that, I will pause there. If there's anybody that has ideas or solutions, feel free to just shout them out. If you have a story to share, feel free to shout them out because I think this is a really great space to just have a little bit of a dialogue around it. Do you know the person's name and where, where he lives? The people that called in, I my assumption is they don't live here. My assumption is that they don't aren't part of this community. Um, you can kind of almost tell because they weren't making anything specific about our community. And that's the other hard part about allowing public comment. Um, virtually, they don't have a camera. Um, you don't know what their contact information is. You don't know who they are. And you, you can almost kind of hide behind that. So it makes it easier to say things that you probably wouldn't say if you were in a public setting. Um, and I won't say a name, but there's a certain um, you know previous president that I think almost empowered people to um, be vile and, and, and use this hate speech, um, and, and it's unfortunate. So, uh, you have you have control over your police department and the FBI, and they definitely are watching these people all over the United States. Yeah. And we need to get, make sure that they're involved so that they can help track this information. The other thing that I wanted to say too is that I came up in the city. And one of the things is about what you hear from the hate was the thing that Martin Luther King used to show that you know people need to get along. And when people hear this hate on this, because I was in a high school and seeing the dog attack black people <coughs> show, okay, that was one of the things that you know, my people, I didn't know that kind of stuff happened in the South. I didn't, if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. So knowing that this hatred is out there and in our own community would also help us to mind as people. You know, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I will share that, um, I was going to try to pass this mic around, but it doesn't seem to be working. Um, our police department did look into it. Um, because if there was a hate crime committed, um, we wanted to make sure that we followed through on that. And unfortunately, um, uh, the police department found no crime was committed. Um, the feds didn't, I'm taking it back to the feds to track the people that are doing it. Because until you stop, um, okay, you know, the federal government, they do, they track the people and they're listening to them. And you know, internet, hey, okay, so, you know, maybe it is that the department needs to work with the feds, not to come up with a solution, but at least to start looking at those people mm -hmm. and how many are in our community. Yeah, our, our police department, there's new reporting requirements, and so um, if anything is flagged, it definitely gets communicated to higher levels of government. I'd like to hear your thought on whether you think that hate speech is by definition off topic. Um, and, 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 and what I would then say is I don't know if it's possible by Zoom or by some other mechanism, but if you could put something on like a seven second delay so that it doesn't get broadcast yeah. and get cut off before any of it emerges. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's the hard part. It, it's it's like definitely the, mix the... Yeah, um, it is a fine line. And actually, Council Member Barber was trying to push staff on this at our last council meeting um, because there was some concern around how is this kind of speech not getting in the way of us doing our business. Um, and again, it's a fine line. I, I don't think it's, I don't think that there's a, you know, that comment was on this line. I mean, there's, there's great, there's a lot of great area there. Um, and 
I'm, fortunately, I guess, with me as chair, I can choose to be a little bit more aggressive in that space, though it doesn't mean that it doesn't put us in some liability yeah. issue, right? So it's trying to find that fine line, um, but also recognizing when too far is too far. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way to make sure that the public doesn't get inflicted on them, because I think that's what you're talking about in terms of the, the dilemma of inclusion. Yeah, um, I think while the public session is going on, there's little that we can do to change that. I know that staff put online an edited version of the meeting that night. Yeah, that's too late. But it's yes, and 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 nothing prevents us from if somebody wanted to. Uh, uh, I want to say Freedom of Information, but records, public records act request, um, you know, they can get the unedited version as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we can talk to staff and, and see what the opportunities are, but I, I think that it's going to be tough while the meeting is live to control that narrative. Well, they, do it, you know, they do it on the news and stuff. You know, yeah. They put things on mm -hmm. and take play. And, and if I, my guess is just the last thing, and that is that um, they get a kick out of the broadcast on yeah. And well, I guess is if it doesn't get broadcast, it will stop. Well, and I, and I think that's kind of, I mean, to your point, I think that's kind of part of what their goal is. is yeah. They want attention, and it's unfortunate. Exactly. I, I tried to, one of my things that I've been trying to learn along my uh, political journey here is the comments that I share with media, um, because they met with me, they interviewed me about this, and I part of my remarks to them was, that this is a distraction from our work, and that's not what they aired. They aired the parts that worked for what they were trying to uh, include in their story. Um, but that's you're right. That's exactly what they want. They're getting that that attention, and we need to make sure that we're trying to prevent that as much as possible. I think the gentleman had an excellent idea. No radio and television. There's live broadcasts in which there's a delay time, mm -hmm. in which you can edit it out. That kind of thing can be heard to the public. Yeah. And that would be the thing I would think you would uh, try to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll, look, I'll talk with staff and see if there are opportunities there. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Brother May, <laughs> um, you had mentioned earlier um, that um, either you or the council had developed a policy with regard to this or were in the process. I was just wondering. If you could tell us what that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of gets a little bit technical, but since you asked, I'll, I, I, can, I can do that. Um, so what we do now um, in response to what happened is we require everybody to identify themselves right at the beginning of public comment. So if you're in the chamber, we say either raise your hand or stand to be identified. And if you're on Zoom, we ask you to raise your hand. And then give about five seconds, five to 10 seconds, for folks to identify themselves as wanting to speak and then we cut it off. So that way, the opportunity was equal to everybody and you only get that one shot. So it prevents that do loop of people signing off and signing back in using a different name. So that was one thing that we did. We've also now have limited public comment for a full period of time. So the standard on the agenda is 30 minutes, though the council could choose to extend that depending on the, the issue, right? So if we're talking about a housing development that's drumming up a lot of energy in the community, we could extend that out to 45 minutes or an hour or so, depending on what our interests are. Um, so trying to just find some time, uh, ways of controlling that and trying to think, was there other things that we... You can suspend. And I can suspend, yeah, I can suspend the meeting. I could, I could you know, request a, a break. I now know, you know, the, the silver lining in this experience is I know now what that's like to go through there and I know how to respond. So if it happens again, I'll be able to jump on it quicker. Um, so part of it was just some learning lessons about how to run the meeting. Um, but we, those are the policies that we, the procedures that we have implemented. I'm sorry you're dealing with that issue, but it sounds like you're advancing the policies. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and a city right next to me, Decatur, Georgia. You, if you want to join the meeting online, you have to register in advance and put your name and address and email. Then they verify that by sending you an invitation. And so it um, reduces the anonymity factor. 
yeah. and they verify your address. So they know if you're from that locale or next door or from another state. Well, so I'll, I'll share that that's illegal. Yes. Um, uh, that's what they do. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> right? Because you don't even have to share your name in a public meeting. You know, so we, we invite people to share their name. Um, but free speech is free speech. And so, um, you know, and this is a national right. Like that's that's a First Amendment right, and so um, yeah, we that was a conversation that came up when we were talking about this. Was could we require people to register? And we could implement the registration, but we can't require their address. We can't require their email, or their phone number, um, and we have to allow it. What? Basically, by creating that registration requirement, we can't do something that's going to prevent somebody from participating. So they, anybody can come to a public meeting in person, but to be online, they require. Well, it's a, it's a, um, like once you go down that path, you have to allow the full participation. Yeah. Tyler, I actually want to thank you for talking about this. Um, I mean, for the county board of supervisors, we also experience um, folks calling in. And it was interesting because it was recorded comments. So we on Zoom, we activate the public comment, and it was a recording that started playing. We had I think three in a row, uh, and we were able to you know intercept them. We have all of the attorneys working to help us figure out what to do and how do we handle this. But I think the important thing as we talk about this, we have city councils, we have county boards, but all of our commissions, any brown active body that takes public comment is subject to these same um, realities. And so the challenge for all of our volunteers who are sitting on the Parks and Rec Commission, or the Commission on Disabilities, or the Citizens Oversight Commission, these folks are also going to need the support and guidance um, of our attorneys collectively, best thinking. And I think there's an important role for the ACLU to play in terms of helping us collectively figure out how to work, how we're going to deal with this. And I just want to finally say, I think you know there's an element of fear that is. Um, that's being sort of pushed onto our communities. And to the degree that we can, I think we try to at our board meeting to respond, saying we're not giving any attention to this at all, and we're moving right along with our business, recognizing that there are limits, and we could put ourselves at liability risk by cutting off comments. I think the city of Salinas is dealing with very similar um, uh, points. So it's, it, this is going to be an ongoing issue as we figure out what our what the laws are and then what case law emerges that allows us to um, to protect our community from these vile and really horrific comments. Oh, and I, I'm Wendy for you to ask you the county board of supervisors. I think I recognize everyone in the room. Why don't we take maybe two more? I saw two hands go up over here, and then um, I'll wrap up my part of it. I appreciate the input. I think it's really helpful for us to have this conversation together. I'm just curious, can they be on Zoom without the picture? Yes, and that was actually can one of the required? Well, that was one of the things that we talked about as well, was looking at maybe requiring them to have cameras on. Yeah. But sometimes people don't have cameras, yeah. or sometimes people are calling into Zoom on their phone. Um, so it does create some barriers. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll even add, and, and Alan, feel free to jump in and talk, but um, there was one uh, resident that was giving us feedback on this topic, and her stance was, just keep the rules the same. Why are you creating all these restrictions for an event that happened one time? Which there's there's an argument there that maybe this won't ever happen again, um, but there was also an argument to be made about us completely eliminating the Zoom option as well. Or they could use the opportunity to show a horrific picture. That's right, that was, that was another thing, because that happened in PG, yeah. where they showed uh, pornographic pictures um, oh. in the image, oh, yeah. in the video. I just feel compelled to say one thing as a professor of constitutional law and a defender of the First Amendment, I'm not going to defend this. I think the hardest area of First Amendment rights is in the area of hate speech, by far. And in other settings, restrictions are, are, are more easily allowed, such as college campuses and places where there's an educational purpose. This is a public meeting. And so whatever rules they make to limit speech at a public meeting applies to all of us. Yeah. That means if we're advocating cutting people off if they don't like what we're saying, they can do that. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to advocate for something we don't want to apply to all speech mm -hmm. just because it applies to hate speech. 
and there may be some further developments every year. There's more cases about this. Uh, but right now, I, I have to sympathize with the city councils and city councils all over because it is one of the hardest issues to deal with in this time of extremism and essentially abuse of First Amendment rights. So I will pass that on to anybody else who wants to speak, but I, I just felt like I needed to say something on behalf of the ACLU and the Constitution. Did you want to make a comment? Oh, okay. Well, I thought I saw another hand up in this space. You said two, but I don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> just really quickly, um, I just wonder about the semantics and how we're defining words. We're talking about civil discourse, and we're talking about speech, speech that is civil, but not um, so much that it's creating emotional abuse. Yeah. So looking at some of those terms, I wonder if, you know, how we can redefine some of those. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate both of these last comments because I think that there's such a space for us to try to push back and fight this and how do we not unduly strip First Amendment rights but create First Amendment rights in a way that helps cement it and, and secure it so that people can feel comfortable in coming forward. And, and your comment makes me think of what happened um, the day after this council meeting. I stopped by City Hall, and this will be my, my last story about this, but stopped by City Hall um, for something completely unrelated, and I ran into one of the city employees that was in the chamber that evening, and she had shared with me her own feelings and how it was the talk of the town, if you will, um, in, in the offices, um, and how shook everybody was on staff right this is their job they're not here maybe they would be but they're not here in their role and their capacity as a community member they're here because of their work um and there were people deeply affected by this and so part of the reason why i'm sharing this is because we have to be able to respect and recognize how do we create a space where everybody feels welcome um, some of us have thicker skin, if you will, or an ability to be able to endure um, hate, such as what we experienced um, in the chambers that evening. Um, but the, the most sensitive person to this topic still should feel welcome um, to the council chambers and we need to make sure we create that space. So I uh, took that opportunity to go around to each of the city offices um, and just check in with staff because that's what we need to do for each other. We need to just make sure that we're, we're all okay and that um, we can continue doing the work that we're all here to do um, together. So I appreciate ACLU for the work that you all do and in, in inviting me to come today. And I'm just gonna send you some love, Regina Mason, for, and congratulations for your honor and distinction today. So thank you all for having me here today. While I'm up here, I'm also going to introduce um, um, Jordan, uh, Jordana Henry, um, who is doc sorry, say doctor. No. No? 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 Okay. Doctor. Okay. Doctor. <laughs> um, introduction of award recipient, and um, and I had a little bit of time to get to know Jordana a little bit before. Um, I, I'm sad that I haven't got to meet her earlier, but full of, of energy and a local um, uh, educator here, born and raised uh, in, in, on the Monterey Peninsula, um, left to go to um, HBCU and, and is back uh, just doing wonderful things. And my little fun fact that I took away from uh, meeting her just now is that she likes to read and go running in her free time. So it's always helpful to get to know folks, um, you know, deeper than what our titles are. So it was an honor to meet you and I'll introduce you and have you come up here to do the introduction of the award. Good afternoon. You have to excuse me, I'm losing my voice. I was with my kids this morning at the high school. We had a Unity Day event and it was about 200 of us out there. And so, I'm trying to get it together. I usually don't talk on Saturdays because I talk so much throughout the week. So I take a lot of silence on Saturdays. 
But it is an honor to be here and to introduce and celebrate one of the most influential people in my life, um, such a valued treasure to our community, uh, Miss Regina Mason. For a long time, I've called her Miss Regina. I just got so used to that. Um, but I say that she is not only my friend, my mentor, but a lot of people don't know this. Growing up, I was like her young little sidekick. Uh, she was like Batman, and I was like a pee wee little. <laughs> um, my parents were very, very strict, and I wasn't allowed to be out in the streets without just cause. And I would say that Miss Regina would give me just cause. <laughs> she, was, she was my reason to be, as the kids would say today, outside, outside. Um, but it was in these moments that I learned the most from her. I was always down to tag along, ride around town, or simply hang out at the NAACP old office on Broadway and be in the dope business. <laughs> I can't even remember how it came to be, but I remember that Ms. Regina encouraged me to run for treasurer of the Youth Council back when I was in high school. And at that time, she was our advisor. Um, but she was so much more to me uh, than an advisor. She was an actual teacher. Um, she was not my teacher in what, we consider, what, what many would consider the traditional sense, nor did she teach me in a school setting. But I had classes at Monterey High, but I was enrolled in Miss Regina's social justice course. <laughs> I would say she taught me community 101, and in this class we learned empathy, compassion, creativity, collaboration, and skills like project management and problem solving. We planned entire youth summits based on the gaps that we saw in our community. We talked to local leaders and invited guest speakers that we thought would engage the youth. The reason why this was so special was because this was our safe space, the Youth Council with Miss Regina. It was the places where our voices mattered, and we felt it. Miss Regina was the type, type of teacher to empower her students. I remember one year where I got this idea that I wanted to put on a play. I'd never written a play, I just thought, Let's do it. Let's have it for entertainment. And the best part about Miss Regina is she never said no. My mom, no. She said no all the time. But Miss Regina, she never said no. So the next step was I had to write a play. And so I wrote a play, but I knew nothing about producing a play, putting on a play. But that wasn't, I didn't have to worry about that because Miss Regina put me in contact with an elder who was a pro at theater. And she came in and she helped us get this play together. And that year, all of our youth council members and youth in the community starred in this play, and we had our own theater course through that process. In addition to Community 101, I was in her advanced placement civic engagement class, <laughs> where we learned about social justice and that our voice was our power. We learned that we have no choice, we have to take action. Miss Regina modeled this for us. On more than one occasion, we witnessed Ms. Regina speak up on behalf of the most vulnerable populations in our community. She always spoke with authority, and she always had solutions. Our classroom was seaside, but on occasion it extended from Sacramento to D.C. and even to New York. I'll never forget on the 50th anniversary of the Voters' Rights Act, which we didn't learn anything about in school, she took a large group of us to Washington and taught us about voter suppression. And on that occasion, we learned how to march. She took us to an event called AXO, where we saw young black scholars excelling in a variety of disciplines. I remember a young black boy, I think he was in about ninth grade, who created a robotic prosthetic hand. And Ms. Regina exposed us to black scholarship. And that greatly impacted my self-esteem and my self-efficacy. I don't know if you all know this, but Ms. Regina was also a language teacher. I was learning words like marginalized and disenfranchised. <laughs> and my favorite words, my favorite phrase of all times, poverty pimping. 
I couldn't wait to get to Monterey High and antagonize my English teacher by using these words in my essay. I was waiting for them to say something to, say something to me. In fact, I dared them to say something to me. Because I know if they had any problems with me, I would just send Miss Regina up there to set them straight and gather them for filth. Because she would. One thing I always knew that, that Miss Regina did not play about me. I also learned that when you say, back to the matter, you have to go in for the kill. <laughs> As I grew older, the course topics grew more advanced and more complex. Rather than economics, I was learning the impact of unequal wealth distribution. I was not just learning psychology, but about mental health issues and the lack of awareness and resources for black and brown communities. I was in a master class on grant writing and funding. However, the most important class I took was an honors course on dreaming. You see, Miss Regina is a visionary. From a village project to Emanyata, to horse therapy and many, many other services and contributions she's envisioned for our community over the years. She taught me that in order to really make a difference, we had to have a vision beyond what we could see now, what we could even understand. She was the first person that taught me, that taught me how to freedom dream. And now I try to pass that on to my students at the high school and at the college level. I could stand up here for hours and share memories and stories about how I gave Miss Regina grief. <laughs> um, but I prefer to talk about her legacy. Not only has she had a significant impact on my life, but she's been influential in my daughter's life as well. I'm sure that everyone in this room has witnessed her passion for her community and her advocacy. You cannot have a conversation with her without discussing the work that needs to be done within the community. I mean, you just pass by and you just want to call and check on her and she's always talking about the new project, the new idea that's coming forth and her face just lights up so we let her. <laughs> but it just shows that service is in her spirit in a way that I've never seen before. I'm so thankful that Miss Regina took me under her wing. At that time, I had no idea that I was going to become a teacher. But what I know now, what I understand now, is that I had the most incredible teacher preparation. Every day I'm inspired by her infinite dedication to this community and particularly the youth. When I think about what all young people need in their lives right now, specifically those from the most marginalized, disenfranchised communities, those who are the most vulnerable, they need us to be their Miss Regina. They need us to be like her and show up give our time. They need us to advocate on their behalf. They need us to have patience and understanding. They need us to see the best in them even when they can't. They need us to be revolutionary. The truth is we all need a Miss Regina and we are blessed to be in the company of such a selfless humanitarian like her. So again, I'm honored, and it is truly a privilege to introduce my mentor, my friend, my teacher, Ms. Regina Mason.
Unfortunately, Congressman Panetta couldn't be here today um, because I'm told that he has to be ready to do some votes, which, you know, I don't understand what that's about, given that uh, the House of Representatives doesn't have a speaker right now. I don't imagine that that's going to happen this weekend. Um, but to not take away, um, on behalf of uh, uh, Congressmember Panetta, I want to give you this uh, recognition and his appreciation for all that you've done for our community. Thank you. Yeah. So very much, uh, and Jordana, thank you so very much. <laughs> I'm so proud of Jordana for all of the accomplishments that she has realized. I mean, she's changing lives in East Salinas like you never believe. All, all of her kids are going to Ivy League schools, and she's the most incredible teacher you'd ever want to meet. So I'm just so proud of her. Um, it is my honor to stand before you today celebrating the legacy of Ralph Atkinson and the tireless dedication of the ACLU to safeguarding civil liberties. In a world where the principles of justice and freedom are more critical than ever, we must acknowledge the pivotal role organizations like the ACLU play. The ACLU, founded in 1920, 11 years after the NAACP, the ACLU forged a relationship with the NAACP early on and continues to this day. And in 1931, the ACLU published, quote, Black Justice, a comprehensive report on institutionalized racism. This was one of the first reports on the subject by a mostly white organization. In 1954, the ACLU joined with the NACP to challenge public school segregation. This action led by the NACP to Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Helen Keller, a co-founder of the ACLU, was an early supporter of the NAACP. She was a uh, regular donor from 1916 until her death. Jane Adams, a co-founder of the ACLU, was a founding member of the NAACP and worked closely with the NAACP co-founder, Ida B. Wells, in the struggle for, to desegregate schools in Chicago during the early years. And so I'm standing on the shoulders, not only of those great people that came before me, but all of the wonderful women in my community and men in my community, many of who are here in this room today, um, to continue to carry the torch. And I am so pleased that I have been able to work with a team of people to advance civil liberties for the people that are so underserved in our community. And so when I think about um, the passion that goes into helping people that are um, living primarily in poverty and dealing with systems of oppression, um, I can't think more than looking at the data that shows that people of African ancestry are the most egregiously impacted people in our community, and not only in our community, but in the world. Um, in America, black people live sicker and die quicker. And I've witnessed that throughout my lifetime, right here in Monterey County, right in Seaside. And I've never left the community of Seaside. I've always lived here. I was born on the former Fort Ord. And so I, I witnessed people in the community of Seaside dying of cancer, um, killings, children not being able to read at grade level. There's so many inequities that are still so needed to be fixed. And so we, we can't do that without our white allyship and other people of color. And so throughout history, organizations such as the ACLU, and we've got Whites for Racial Equity, 
and many other groups that <laughs> align themselves with social justice issues that have to work together to move the needle. Um, one of my passions right now in, in this community is the fact that every single day there's not someone that is not either coming to the Village Project, continuing to call mail, or talking to the NAACP about an injustice that they're having to deal with. And the majority of those people are people of African ancestry. And so when I think about social justice right now, for me, we've got descendants of the military in Seesaw who have been out-migrated and gentrified out of our community. And we cannot even buy a house in Seaside. And so that's another civil rights issue that I'm prepared to take on. Um, I've been organizing people in the community that are the impacted people. And I'm working with those individuals because they deserve to live in a community where their fathers and grandfathers and mothers fought in these wars, and on Fort Ord, we've got land out there. What about us? What about the descendants of the military? And so I'm one of the descendants of the military. So, so that's about to be another social justice issue that the community is going to have to take on. Because it's not just about those of us that have been able to get educations and come back and do work in the community and help people. Because we work tirelessly um, because people are so underserved and I mean I think that now when I think about myself it's not just me it is all the people here such as Monica Monica was a NACP Youth Council advisor Stacy was a member of the Youth Council and so the, the the work that we have done has been passed to the next generation and the next generation are extremely woke and they have social media and they've got the the wisdom of the elders, and I, unfortunately, am an elder now. <laughs> <laughs> and, the strength, <laughs> and the strength of the young, because they've got access to technology. And so, you know, I think that when I am going to some of these meetings with the individuals that are the most impacted, I mean, we've got people living, um, like, in their cars that have children. And these are kids who have grown up in the community who literally have had um, their fathers or grandfathers um, stationed at Fort Ord, and we've got land right out there. So what is wrong with that picture that we can't get some of that land for the young people in our community to stay in Seaside? Because what has happened to Seaside is disgraceful, and it is just so... It's, it's just, you know, I can't even think of a, a good word to say what's, what's happened to our community. We have no black-owned businesses. We have a few black-owned businesses that we know of, but we used to have, when I walked down the street of Seaside as a child, I had black teachers, I had stores to go into, families took care of each other, and there were lots of things going on in the community in terms of crime and all of that, but there was a sense of community. Yes. And now what we have is, there are, there's about, I looked at some data from the census, and there's about 2,500 people of African ancestry in Seaside, when it used to be about 30% of the city of Seaside was people of African ancestry. And so we have been intentionally run out of town and out migrated because Seaside is beautiful. When you look around the community of Seaside, you can stand on any corner and see the beautiful ocean. And it's all the housing there is now occupied by people that don't look like us. And so I just want to uplift that because that is a, a civil rights issue, that and health. And, and economic um, opportunities. And so um, I'm most proud that the young people that I've worked with and others alongside me that I've worked with, they are taking over. And so we're able to impart our wisdom upon them. And I'm certain that we're going to 
to make some changes because it's really not about when you have people coming in I'm not saying people shouldn't come into the community that haven't lived here all their lives this is a beautiful place to live but why have you um, out migrated black people from Seaside and in Monterey County and so you know when you have people on city councils and in, in our government and elected officials that are going to have to get on this bandwagon. And it's not just happening in Seaside. It's happening in a lot of these military towns, and San Francisco is one. Yes. Um, when Mayor, um, when, when, when Governor Newsom was mayor of San Francisco, he did a study called the Outmigration Study to find out why is it that black people are leaving the city of San Francisco, what do we need to do to keep them there, and how do we bring them back? And that study was done by the black community leaders and the San Francisco State University Ethnic Studies Department. And so I've been researching that lately and I'm bringing it to the people because it really is all about the people. This is our community, our, our responsibility. And people say, well, why do you keep helping people and aren't you tired? Oh, you do it because you're passionate. Well, if not me, then who? It is all about us. We are our brothers and sisters keepers, and we do have to teach our children that the true identity of who they are, so they won't be lied to. Um, and that is why um, one of the reasons I'm aware of all of these issues is because I do I read, and I I was a social worker, and I came across every systemic system of racism and oppression in the whole county and I've been all over to North County to South County in the field of child welfare looking at poverty and seeing what that really looks like and it's poor oppressed people black and brown but the people that have been most impacted in terms of the data are the health of black people and Hugh Stallworth who was the um, then Health Department um, did a study on African American health disparities in Monterey County. And it was so egregious back in 2007. And the study just went nowhere. And that study is, is it's gotten worse for black people in terms of their health and all the black people that have died. And I'm not just uplifting black people. However, that is the group that has been most impacted. And I am not going to apologize for uplifting black people because right. they are people that have built this whole country and people marginalized all throughout the country. And so right now, I say all politics is local. So it is time to go to war because the reality at this point is that if we don't do something immediately, we're going to look around, and black people are going to be extinct in Seaside and in Monterey County. Because that land on Fort Ord belongs to us as well. And so we need to put a stake in the ground and make sure we get not some million dollar homes, but some low income and affordable housing in Seaside. There's so much money at the state level and you see some cities that are taking advantage of getting some of those funds but people don't want to have i i do believe there's there, not a conspiracy but there's a an intentionality about moving black people out of monterey county because they know black people are one of the most strongest people on the face of the earth mm -hmm. i mean if our ancestors survived the middle passage and all of the great things that have been done in the world have been invented by black people, and they don't get the credit for it. And so basically, when I um, look at, and, and I so appreciate being acknowledged for uh, this award, because I, I do truly appreciate it, and I think that the NHCP and the um, ACLU have so much in common. And um, now we've got whites for racial equity here, and I'm really looking forward to them standing by our side because they have always, we've always had um, our white allyship stand by our sides from the time our ancestors were escaping um, slavery. 
and the Quakers that were hiding them. So we've had white allyship along the way um, throughout history, and so we're going to have to call on our white allies to stand by our side now so that we do not become extinct in Monterey County and that we do have the opportunity for our young people to be able to live here, to buy a home in their community. Um, and I'm very blessed that my young little prince son is here, <laughs> who's blessed me with a beautiful three-month-old granddaughter. because he can't afford to live in his own community. And so this is a shame because people, you know, in, in our culture, culturally congruent approaches to working with our, our folks is so critical because grandma wants to be able to care for the grandchild. Why do I have to travel all across town to another city? And most of our, our people are, you know, their children are living in other states and they don't even have access. And so the bottom line is that we've got to change that. And I think that um, all of us working together, um, we, we can make sure that some of that land on Fort Ord is given to the people who help build this community. So um, there's one other thing that I'm extremely passionate about, and that is that um, through the criminal justice system, we have been harmed greatly. There are children today that are living with relatives, and not just one family, but many families, who have parents who are incarcerated in Monterey County Jail. Now, these are non-violent crimes, and also, if you had an opportunity to look at crime from a trauma-informed perspective, you would think that a judge would say, okay, you know what? If you go through these programs and you're making progress and you're doing what you need to be doing to deal with your unresolved childhood traumas that really came about through poverty, then I'm going to let you stay home with your child and raise your child. Because who's devastated by a parent being incarcerated and not having access to these little kids. And that's what's happening in Monterey County Jail. We get calls all the time from Monterey County Jail because the Village Project, which is the agency that I helped to co-found along with many others, um, we have many programs. We are a mental, we were a mental health clinic. We were not supposed to be doing all the programs that we're doing. But every time people came to get their therapy, then they have all kinds of other issues happening. And we send them to existing programs and they come back knocking on our door and they say, they can't help me. And we were like, well, wait a minute, they're getting money to help you. What's happening here? And no one's really paying attention to this. And so we would write for a grant and create another program. But it's really, that's not the way to operate. I mean, the bottom line is, you know, everybody that's incarcerated, should they have an opportunity to have treatment going in there. They can have college courses in prison. They can have good food and vegetables. We live in the lettuce capital of the world um, and with the ag community. And, you know, I just think that there's a better way that you can treat people to make sure that they can be lifted out of poverty. And that's another... Um, just another issue that is happening to countless people. And the reason I know this, this is not, I don't have to go and do some evidence-based practice because it's right there in my face, you know? So um, the Village Project is part of 35 um, statewide organizations through the, the Office of Health Equity under the California Reducing Disparities Project. And we're not the only ones that are experiencing, experiencing what we are experiencing. And those are BIPOC or LGBTQ plus organizations that are experiencing the same issues in their communities. So together we've been fighting and, and working with the governor who actually, our Imanata Saturday School is funded through the Office of Health Equity, um, the California Department of Public Health. And so during the pandemic, we were able to lobby Governor Newsom to refund that program for another four years, and now it's going to be sustained indefinitely. Because <laughs> children, 
Pinata Saturday School, these children are learning their true identity, their cultural heritage. And they, today, in fact, we had Saturday School, and we went to visit Alexis Nino's grave site and the Buffalo Soldiers. These kids are not learning about who they are, about their ancestry. Some kids don't even know who their grandparents are. But through the Pinata Saturday School, these children know that there are 54 countries on the continent of Africa. And when they show up to school, no one can lie to them because they have the truth. And they're being um, taught how to do research, and they're K through fourth grade. And if these little kids, they soak up this knowledge like you'd never believe. And so I'm just really pleased that I've been blessed to have the health that I got and also to have people that I work with that think like I do, that want to see all people successful. And I think that um, we have a lot of work to do, and I'm glad that we're able to pass it on to the next generation. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Stacy Andrews, who is the Village Project's new executive director. And, um, <laughs> also a member of the NAACP Youth Council. And so uh, we've got Nargis Mosenpour, who just got her PhD in um, clinical psychology, and she's back at the village. I mean, so we've got evidence that our programs work, and it's about um, making sure that you respect people's culture, and um, that cultural congruency is important, and that community-defined practices work for our people. And so I, I could go on and on, but I do just want to you know, put that out there and uplift what I've told you here today because you may not be aware that there are people suffering, living in cars with children when, they're, when their parents, uh, when we should have some land on Fort Ord and get some housing, not only on Fort Ord, but in Seaside as well. Um, and not just like Fort Ord has that empty land right now. So the thing is, is that every time I ask people about the land on Broadway, it's been sitting there vacant for so long. And I see all these people walking the streets with shopping carts and they don't have a place to stay. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what about this apartment? When is it going to, they're like, well, water is the problem. Yeah. Well, why is it that Pebble Beach gets eight yes. bathrooms and Seaside can have water to build anything for anyone. I mean, no one's been able to give me an answer to that question yet. I've gone and talked to several people that are supposed to be water experts, and they're talking about water credits. Well, how come folks in Seaside don't have water credits? That's just, to me, it, it doesn't make any sense, because we have to put human needs before profit mm -hmm. and greed. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that you'll be hearing more about this issue of, of Fort Ord and the land because we can ill afford to let people come in and take our land, build multi-million dollar homes, and run us out and become extinct because we help build Seaside. Black people help build this community. And so if you look around, I've, I rarely see um, black people walking the streets of Seaside anymore. I mean, literally, I mean, I was, I walked my granddaughter down to the office from my house, and all I saw were white people, and we've been gentrified out of our community, and so I think something's got to be done about that, and um, I'm willing to um, help do something about it, and I'm just one person, though, so we need everyone's help, so um, I'm going to leave it at that, and just really thank each of you for, um, you know, for being here on this afternoon and um, standing on, I'm standing on the shoulders of all these great women and I see that our uh, Ann Jealous is in the audience, who's one of my mentors as well.
State Senator John Laird and Assemblywoman Abbott. Congratulations, you know, there's no one that deserves this more than you. Um, I come here before you on behalf of Assemblymember Don Ellis, but also Senator John Laird, who they weren't able to be here today, but they are granting you state recognitions on behalf of the state of California and on behalf of the State Assembly and the State Senate for your work, commitment, to serving, and understanding the communities and being an inspiration and beacon of hope for many. We thank you for all you've done. I am a witness that you are always engaged, always present, and that's what we need more of in our communities. So thank you, and let's continue to work. Thank you. Thank you. And next is a statement to be read uh, from retired State Senator Bill Monning. Yes, Alan Hoffman. So it's my honor to uh, read this letter um, from Senator Lonnie um, uh, on behalf of Senator Lonnie. Dear ACLU Chapter Chair Erlen Hoffa, members of the board, fellow members, guests, and Regina and Mel Mason family. We regret we were unable to join you for today's presentation of the Ralph B. Atkinson Civil Liberties Award. We appreciate the opportunity to extend our congratulations to Regina Mason as this year's award recipient and to express our appreciation for Regina's years of dedicated service to the cause of civil rights and the protection of civil liberties for all. We've had the honor and pleasure of knowing Regina for many years and can attest to her lifelong dedication to the struggle for human rights, civil liberties, and justice for all. Regina has embodied and represented a dedication and commitment to civil liberties in so many areas, including family, community and leadership positions with the NAACP and the NAACP Youth Council. Over the past decade, we have admired Regina's leadership as a co-founder with Mel Mason of the Village Project, Inc., which has empowered young people and families through the provision of culturally appropriate and focused mental health and educational services for African American youth and families, as well as for many other minority and underserved youth. We applaud the ACLU of Monterey County and Northern California for your continued leadership in the fight for civil liberties on all fronts. We carry the memory of Ralph B. Atkinson as inspiration in our continued struggles for equality and justice, as we are inspired by the selection of Regina Mason as recipient of the 2023 Ralph B. Atkinson Award. Thank you, Arlene, and members for your leadership and for this opportunity to join you via this communique. We're with you all in spirit and solidarity. Senator Bill Monning retired and Dana Kent MP. If I did not acknowledge our uh, current uh, board member, Jeanette Walton, who is in the audience today, and also Ed Armstrong. So, yeah. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, we have Supervisor Wendy Rukaski. So we have a resolution from the full board on our beautiful new stationery, but it was short of signature, so it wasn't framed and ready yet. So we will make sure it gets delivered. It's a beautiful new uh, stationery from the board of supervisors. And what an honor for me to be here, Regina, and to hear the stories of you growing up and to hear you talk about your work today. I always sort of reflect, I was reflecting as you were speaking about um, one, of the, one of the issues that I've had the honor of working with you on, which was removing our police officers from uh, schools in the Modern Peninsula Unified School District. And it was not an easy process, and it took multiple years, and it took you know going around and gaining the support and building the votes and building the, the argument that this really wasn't what was in the best interest of our students. Um, it was looking up the, 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 the reports of every time an SRO had been called, and one of them being a six-year-old, a first grader, the, the SRO had been called to take the child away from the parent because they were crying. And, Stories like that that are just horrible. 
But we finally got it done, and I remember talking to you, and I was like, this is, we, we did it, you did it, it happened. Um, and you were already on to the next thing. And I was like, oh, well, that's right, there's more work to do, that's right, okay. But, but I think it, it was this, this a vision beyond um, that is the best description I've ever heard. You're, you're, you're like a hundred steps ahead, and you're full speed, and you're just bringing everyone along with you. And it is because of that that I find myself sort of, yeah, let's go. Like, I'm, I'm there. Like, I'm following you. Um, so thank you for being that leader, and thank you for providing our community with that vision beyond, um, because that is how change happens. And, and the stories that you tell and the, the realities that you speak so um, so confidently about, their stories and their issues that need to be shared, um, their realities that I think so often people are not aware of um, unless they hear it, and sometimes you need to hear it again and again and again. So with that, I just had to read a few of the statements from our county um, uh, resolution. Um, adopting Regina, recognizing Regina Mason on receiving the American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California, Monterey County Chapter Branch, Ralph B. Atkinson Civil Liberties Award for 2023. Whereas Regina Mason has spent over 30 years working in civil rights advocacy and community organizing, collaborating with organizations to address and resolve the issues confronting our community and beyond. Whereas Regina Mason has worked with the Monterey County branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People for over 25 years, with extensive knowledge working with underserved youth and families to give back to her community. Whereas in 2008, following the passage of the landmark California Mental Health Services Act, Regina Mason seized the opportunity to co-found the Village Project, an African-American focused family resource center that provides a myriad of services to African American and other historically underserved groups of people. Whereas Regina Mason was awarded the 2013 Jefferson Award, the Outstanding Women of the Year Award by the Monterey County Commission on the Status of Women, the 27th Assembly District Women of the Year Award, the Youth Honoring Youth Award from the Community Partnership for Youth, Youth and the 2015 Community Service Award from the Leadership Monterey Peninsula. I'm sure there's many more. Whereas Regina Mason is being honored today by the ACLU of Northern California um, as the 45th Annual Ralph B. Atkinson Award recipient. Now therefore be it resolved that the Monterey County Board of Supervisors, on behalf of our county and all residents thereof, hereby recognize and commend Ms. Regina Mason for her lifetime of daring to create a more perfect union for our underserved youth and our families um, here in Monterey County, culminating with the receipt of the support today. On behalf of my colleagues on the board, thank you for everything you do for her.